you would, turn to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, and as soon as I say what I'm going to share, a lot of times the reaction is, that story, well, I've heard that story 15 times. But I like to think of these stories, the reminders, that they're actually history. Their history and is all of our history. I like history. I think we have to learn from history, and I think that's why it's there, so that we can learn from it. We're going to look at three men tonight, four if we had time, but I don't want to keep you here late. We're going to look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Learn something. I've always said Abednego. It's not Abednego. It's Abed Dash Nigo. Abed Nigo. Try to say that fast. You can't. Right? I can't do it. I say Abednego every time. But anyhow, we're going to look at those three. I'm going to look at them in the aspect. I shared this. I do the Tuesday Truth devotional on Facebook, and um, during the course of the week, usually the Lord just lays something on my heart. That's what I do on Tuesday night. I do it with limited notes. I just do it. I do a song with it, and the Lord leads. I get my, my 15, 20 minutes, whatever out of it. And this one here, I just it really it touched me. Just the things I saw in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But what really triggered me, I would had no idea to do this here tonight. But I went down, my dad's in Woodland, and there's a couple other people I visit in there when I'm there. And Greg Shore, he's in really bad shape. His mother was just moved there this week, and he hadn't been able to see his mother since August. And uh, she listens faithfully to my Tuesday truth, but I've never met the woman. So I went down to visit her, and as soon as I walked in, she said, you're Jeff Black, aren't you? I said, I am. And, and she said, your last Tuesday truth just pierced me. She said, it was just like I seen what you were saying about the fire. And she said, I needed that. And that just pierced right through me. And I thought, wow, maybe I need to share that again. So that's what I'm going to do. And uh, I tried to make some notes. And you can tell I'm not a trained ordained minister. Because there's my notes. I usually do better. But this one here, a lot of this just comes from the heart. I want us to see things tonight through Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. One is unity. One is the strength to stand up strong. Keep that in mind of the present day world we're living in and the upcoming election and what's being pushed and endorsed. And then lastly, they trusted God. And they saw the fourth man in the fire. And you know what? He's still there. They come out. He stayed there. So, being led to share this tonight, I'm thinking there's probably somebody here that's going through a fire. Maybe you're thrown into the fire. Maybe there's just something. I don't know. I don't know the hearts. I don't know people's lives. I know I needed to hear it. So, we're going to start. We have a lot of scripture tonight. So, we're going to buzz through this. Hit the high points in the notes. And uh, I pray you get something out of it. I'm going to open in a word of prayer here quick. Dear Lord, we thank you for the examples you have left us in the Bible of these faithful men. Lord, there's some that's more prominent, there's some we've hardly ever heard of. But when we study out the people in the history of the Bible and realize that it is true history and we can glean from it, you left us some really good role models in your scriptures. Help us to learn from them, glean from them, and most of all, be an encouragement and bring glory to you through them. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go back to the book of Daniel. We're going to start at the beginning. We'll set the stage here. Daniel 1, verses 1 through 7. This is what's going on. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, no, Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. Here's key. Verse 4. Who he once brought. He wants children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of wine which he drank, 
so nourishing him three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Now, the one we hear the most about in the Bible is, of course, Daniel. It's dare to be a Daniel. We know what Daniel did. Daniel was faithful just as these men were. The very next verse. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. I'd like to plant a seed. Study this through. This is just the beginning of what Daniel did. Daniel would refuse to eat what the king was giving, as would Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not do anything against God. And we know he ended up in the lion's den, and in a day that the lions could have had a feast, they weren't hungry. Imagine that. Think that in the hand of God, blessing the faithfulness of Daniel. Well, we're not going to look at Daniel tonight. We're going to look at these three that had their names changed. I thought that was interesting. Notice he wanted people that were smart. Basically what he did, they besieged and took over Judah, but they didn't want just anybody brought up. They picked the cream of the crop. The king wanted those who could benefit him. Modern day, who usually benefits from the government and corporate America, everyone else? It's usually the ones that have something to give. You either have to be rich. How many, how many poor politicians do you see? This blows my mind. They wonder why the country is the state it's in. A poor person can't run for political office. There's just no way. You can't afford the campaigns. Well, basically, that's what the king's doing. He wants these men that are well-versed in science. He wants men that are intelligent. He wants basically people that he can train. Notice three years. And then he wants them to be full-blown Babylonians and in charge of his things. So he's taking advantage of the situation. So now let's fast forward to Daniel in verse, or chapter 3, Daniel 3, we're going to start verses 1 through 6, and we're going to see what happens to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And again, we're going to make some points as we go. <clears throat> verse three, chapter 3, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And notice this isn't what the people set up. Again, this is what Nebuchadnezzar set up. That's one thing about living under a king. Democratic rule is either. What the king wants, the king gets. So he sets this up, and he's telling all these judges, sheriffs, he's bringing all the people of authority in, and he's going to tell them, we're going to worship this. Verse 3, the princes, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurer, I'm not going to do that whole list again. They were gathered together under the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages so now he's including everyone and this would include Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet flute, harp, sack, but psaltery, dulcimer and all kinds of music ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up so now he's telling them what they have to do and we'll see why it's have to do in his eyes here shortly but again, keep this in the scale of where we're living right now and what we're being asked to accept. At Dublin Mills this morning, we, we had a Sunday school lesson, and it was blended in about tolerance. How much are we asked to tolerate? And what should our tolerance level be as Christians? And everything else. And that's basically what's going on here. These men are still men of God. The king of Babylon is trying to convince them that they're going to be Babylonians. And they're going to be his governing people. But you're going to see what happens. Verse 6, here's why they had to do it. 
Whoso falleth not down in worship shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So basically, we see here, this was set up, and most of the people, it says all, most of the people bowed down. So he was getting his way, and they did it out of fear. And I think that is, that's another point I'd like to bring out tonight. We can't live life in fear. Right now is a scary time in our country, I think, because people are so worried about what the circumstances are going to be if this party wins. They're worried about what are we going to do if this party wins. The fact of the matter is, it does not matter what political party we have. The general culture of life right now is wanting us to accept things that compromise the word of God. It compromises just as this king was asking them to do. They knew they shouldn't bow down and worship anything but God. They knew that in their minds. So here they are. They've been under this king's training, per se, for three years. And it's been drilled into them. You do what that king says, and everything will be just fine. Now the time comes when he sets his idol up, and it says that these people bow down. So let's jump down here. Look at verse 8. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. I wonder why they did that. Well, let's jump down to verse 12. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. So, they stuck together. What I got out of this part here was, when this happened, you didn't, at least it's not here, and I'm assuming with what goes on to, to happen, you don't have three men saying, what are you going to do? I don't know. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to bow down. I'm not getting thrown in no fire. And maybe one of them bow down. And, no, get back up. We can't do that. I don't see none of that. I see three men that flat out said, I'm not bowing down. Are you bowing down? Oh, I ain't bowing down. There ain't no way I'm bowing down. I know what my God says. Well, that's what they did. How are we doing? Are we compromising? Are we bending? Are we bowing down to certain things? And quite honestly, yeah, especially if you work a normal secular job and it's any type of a corporation, to an extent, we are being forced to bow down. I experience it at work all the time. I can't wait to retire. I don't want to get that old that fast. But boy, I can't wait to get out from under corporate America's thumb because they dictate what you do. They tell you what you're doing. And if you don't, they tell you where the pavement is and which way's home. It's as simple as that. And we now, as Christians, are the silent majority. And that's why things happen the way they do. We're the silent majority. In Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I don't see any silence here. I think if the king would have said to them, why didn't you bow down? I think they would have, they would have got an answer, which we're going to look at that a little bit here. We're going to go... Just a little bit further. Where did I stop at? Okay, verse 14, I believe, where we are. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, all them instruments again, ye fall down and worship the image, which I have made, well, a notes, semicolon, colon. This is the king giving them a second chance. Notice it says all that. And he said, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, 
he's saying, that's good. But if you worship not, he shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? I think of something here. This came up. We just had a revival. I think this is where this came up. I have a mind it's, it's a part-timer. I don't know where anybody else says part-timers or not. I hear lots of things, but I can't remember where I heard them. But I know I heard in the last couple of weeks something about the second look. And it really got the, the, my wheels turning. Because when you think about temptation, when you think about that opportunity to fail, when you look upon something, I thought the first one that came to mind was David when he was on the rooftop and saw Bathsheba. If he would have just, whoa, turned around, got himself off of that roof, nothing else would have happened. He wouldn't have had to murder somebody. He wouldn't have had to cover this, cover that. It's the second look. The second look's often what gets us. You see something, and if you spend any time on the computer, eventually something pops up in front of you. It's inevitable. Something pops up in front of you, and it's like, whoa, why in the world did that pop up? Well, if you quickly get rid of it, well, I'm good. If you take that second look and like, whoa, what's that? And then, then, and then, it's the second look. Well, here we see he's giving them a second chance. The first time they passed the test. So now he's making them think about it. Look, guys, I already told you you're going in the furnace unless you do this. If you do it now, I'll give you a second chance. Well, then we're good. But if you don't, then this is what's going to happen. What do they say? Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Again, there's the three. They're unified. They answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we see this unity coming up here several times. We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will, there's no doubt, deliver us out of thine hand, O king. You see us in there several times. You see we. You see our. These men... I think of them as three warriors with their arms joined together and they're saying, if we go down, we're going down together. But listen, King, we don't serve your God. We're not worshiping that idol. We're worshiping our God. You're not going to change our minds. Verse 18, But if not, be it known unto thee, O King, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. What a brave and faithful stand. And again, this is a challenge. I wish there was more people to hear this, but the people who are here, I think, need to hear it. We need to make that strong stand. You may lose a friend or two. I probably lost a friend or two. Because I tell it how it is. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Don't try to make me accept what's wrong to make you feel better. That was part of the Sunday school lesson this morning, too. At what point do we just separate ourselves from people because of that? I used to work with a lady, and her family had a few issues. And she was a Christian. But if you said anything to condemn anything that they were involved in, she got mad. I mean, she would be like, you just don't understand their situation. You don't understand. You don't. And I just, I just shut up and never brought it up again. I just left it go. But I'm thinking, at what point do you just be firm and say, look, it's wrong. I'm sorry. You don't want to talk to me. But their soul depends on it. And that's the other thing. When you look at it, tolerance and everything else, this is Old Testament. This is worshiping the true God here. But in our testament, us standing firm and strong in this day and age could be the difference between a soul being in heaven or hell. Because if you just nice guy something away and don't tell people, hey, this, this is really sin, maybe they don't understand it's sin. I think that's, I, again, I share this often. I didn't get saved later in life. I was 32 years old, so I had a pretty good taste of what sin was. But if you're somebody that grew up in the church and you were saved at a young age, you don't really know. So on the flip side of that, if you're somebody that never grew up in church, never was church, read the Bible, had the Sunday school stories, you didn't have none of that, 
then the stuff that you think is fine really isn't fine. But unless a Christian stands up and tells you, what you're doing is wrong, man, you might hurt their feelings, but you might save them from hell. And I'm off the path here now. I just, as our pastor likes to say, jumped up on a soapbox. But it's true. I mean, I, compared, we're talking thousands of years difference here. And that's the difference here. They're standing up to the true God, but we must stand up so that souls can be saved. But that's what I wanted to get out of that section, was they stayed united and not one of them wavered. Think of that as a church body. We talked about that this morning too, church discipline. If you have a body of Christ and there's sin within that body, it has to be addressed. There is a, a way, there's a biblical way that's in most church constitutions, doctrinal statements. It's how you do it. You do it biblically, but it needs to be addressed. I like the old saying, one rotten apple spoils the bushel. And you have to do things God's way. And that's what these men were doing. Moving on. Verse 19 through 23, we're going to see what's going on here with the king's fury now. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed. I can picture this guy. He used to watch cartoons. Right now, I'm picturing this guy as being that guy that just turned red. His eyes started to water. The top of his head blew off. and the, That's where he's at. He is so mad at these guys. It says his form of his visage, visage was changed. So I'm assuming that would be his appearance. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. How many ever burnt their finger on the stove? That's pretty hot, wasn't it? Let's magnify that by about 100, and then maybe by another 10. And now we're starting to get close to what he was going to have this furnace set. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army, bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And something else here, and I'm not going to go deep into this because I could be wrong. I don't see a fight here. The only thing I see that kind of indicates it could have been a struggle was that the king commanded the most mighty men that were there. So maybe there was. But I see men that are willing to be martyrs. I see men that are firmly saying, we're going to trust God. And King, as we said, our God will deliver us from this. Verse 22, Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the fame of the fire, the flame of the fire, slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This fire is so hot that those very men that threw them in died. Just that heat coming out killed them. These men were thrown in. And think about in all their all their garments. So think how quick that should have just poof and just been ashes. Verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished. He rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Wow. The fourth man. The fourth man in the fire. And you notice... They're walking about. I think this is hilarious just for the sake of the fact of the king. Because this guy, put yourself in this king's shoes. He just blew his sack. He's, he's human. He just had his mighty men bound these guys. They died when he threw them in the fire. And now he looks in and these ones that he wanted so bad to just be incinerated into dust. They're in there just walking around. But who's this fourth guy? Now I'm thinking this is about the time that Nebuchadnezzar started to think, wow, 
Maybe there is really something to this God they keep speaking about. Maybe, just maybe, this is the real deal. And then I'm thinking, he's kind of thinking, if this God is the real deal, I'm in real trouble. So, there's a lot going on in this king's mind about it now. Verse God's protection in the fire. That's where we're at. I'm thinking about this, and there was one thing that I didn't get, I didn't study into this real deep. But Nebuchadnezzar said, the form is like the Son of God. How did he know what the form of the Son of God was? I'm going to read you into that. I'm going to dig. I encourage you, if you're a, a, a commentary guy, I'm going to get on a soapbox here. It's time for an infomercial. Um, Warren Wearsby commentaries. Um, our pastor had advised me about these and he does book by book in the Bible but he puts it in such terms that I understand it and it makes perfect sense and he explains this stuff I've got three of them so far and I use them a lot Daniel's going to be probably the next one I order and uh, I have one of Joshua I love Joshua I, uh, I did a little study and I've been filling in down at Burnt Cabin's Bible Church uh, pray for them, by the way. Pastor Titus has kind of given them some guidance. They're seeking a pastor. I've been filling in off and on down there. But um, I've been using those commentaries to, to set up a lot of my sermons now. And uh, they're wonderful commentaries. If, you, if you're somebody that gets in a commentary and you're, like, confused, get a Warren Wearsby commentary. I encourage you. They're good. But I guarantee he'd explain this in a way that I couldn't. So I'm not going to. But I was kind of curious there. How is he says... The form of the fourth is like the Son of God. That just kind of made me wonder a little bit. But then moving on, verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God. Oh, what? You don't want us anymore? <laughs> Funny how it changed now. It's not, hey, you guys, you work for me, you get out of here. No, now it's all of a sudden... Ye servants of the Most High God. There's some recognition. Come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and king's counselors being gathered together saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire passed on them. Wow. You talk about amazing. Think about this and realize this is where you got to start using your mind and process this as an actual life event. This is not just a cool story that you said, would you read that story? That was awesome. This happened. This is true history. These men were actual human men just like you and I. They had same skin, same hair, same everything we have. And they were put into a fire that was several thousand degrees. Never touched them. Imagine that. And the other interesting part is how God controls the power of even fire. I think back, remember when the, um, the false prophets of Baal and the, the worth when he called down fire upon the altar. Remember how that fire just licked up everything and devoured it into dust. Even the stones and the altar were dust. Our God, that's our God, controls the power of fire. Man, that ought to just make you want to, especially if you're going through something right now, cling to God. Hold on to God. Don't hold on to your buddy. Don't hold on to, and I'm not saying this in a disrespectful way, don't hold on to your spouse. Your spouse has the same power to save and do and change as what we do. God has the power. Now I will add, pray. If you want to pray with your spouse, pray with your spouse. Pray. That's one thing Brother Tom Palmer said last week that stuck with me at our revival. He said, pray or prayer. Prayer can do anything God can do and God can do anything. It was basically saying that prayer was our connection to the power of God. Does that sink in? Prayer can do anything. God, 
prayer can do anything God can do, and God can do anything. The power of prayer. Pray, pray, pray. The big thing here, too, is the change of heart. This is the example these men made and the impact they made, and not just on anybody, on somebody that was a powerful, powerful figure. So when we think of our testimony and how we go through things, we're watched. If people know you're a Christian, they see how we act, they see how we react, they see how we go through things, how we handle things. So just like these men, they see us delivered from things. And they realize that, wow, you know, that all worked out. But you know, I didn't see them once lose their, you know, they didn't lose their cool. They weren't swearing, jumping up and down, cursing. They just seemed like they stayed calm. And every time I'd ask them something, they'd say, well, it's in God's hands. What's that mean? Well, that's, that opens the door for an opportunity to witness. But God can, if it's his will. So, where am I at now? One, another soap there. Verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent this angel, his angel and delivered his servants and trusted in him. That trusted in him. So see, the king's completely flipped now. It's not, they're no longer his. There, he keeps referencing their God. And have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Let's just go ahead through the end of the chapter. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. Their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So what we saw here was complete deliverance. But we also saw a complete change of heart. And I'll say that to say this, which was not part of my original, so I'm going to have to, I'm going to tiptoe around this a little bit, and this is the light of the election again. He changed the heart of the king. God puts everybody in power. <coughs> but everybody that's in power has a heart that can be changed. I think that came back the way I wanted it to. How does it change? Pray. Pray for those in power. If the election don't go the way you want it to, don't jump up and down and complain for the next election. Start praying. Pray, pray, pray for the hearts of those in power. Because as we see here, through the example of three men, put that into perspective. Three men. Three men literally changed the heart of an evil king to the extent that he ordered his entire, not only his, but other people, every people, nation, and language. That's pretty much everybody. You don't say nothing against these guys' God, or you'll be destroyed. Cut to pieces, it says. So they went from a King Nebuchadnezzar who was trying to manipulate, mold, and change them, which is kind of what the world's doing to Christians. It went full circle to where those three men manipulated, changed, and molded the king to the extent that he was going to have an impact now in all the nations. Three men. One person can do mighty things. Why did this happen? How did this happen to these three men? One, because they stood strong. Two, because they stayed unified. They stuck together. And lastly, they trusted God. They trusted God no matter what. King, you throw me in there. My God will deliver me. If he doesn't, then so be it. It's God's will. They turned it over to God. So we too must do the same thing in this wicked world we live. And we are in the midst of the fire. Remember, God's there. God never came out of that fire. There's a song about that. You don't want me to try to sing it. But there is. There's a song about that. 
is still in the fire. So if you're going through something tonight, I encourage you. God's still there. Don't ever think God leaves you. God never forsakes you. God will never be that. And I was talking to Brother Mike a little bit in the parking lot right there. And he said about the twinkling of an eye, how we sometimes we don't realize that we're going to be present with the Lord like that. And I, I agree. I said, Mike, I can, I can stand here talking to you, and all of a sudden there's Jesus. I mean, that's how quick it is. I mean, the soul lives on forever. The body just goes. The, the soul lives on forever. And what's precious. And God never leaves us. We're in his hand. From start to finish, we just accept that and let him take over.